Let's go ahead and get started. So, thanks everyone for coming out to our talk today about recipes. And we're going to talk about sort of recipes generally, but also specifically around some of the recipes that are being used for managing events, so dates and times within your Drupal website. So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Martin Anderson Klutz. I'm a senior solutions engineer at Acquia, also on the Talking Drupal podcast. And earlier this year, I was named as the events recipe track lead as part of the Starshot initiative. Um, also, I've put a few of them around, but if anybody wants, there's fun like Drupal 11 sunglasses and lays. They're uh, at the Acquia table at the far end of the, uh, the sponsor hall as well. So help yourself uh, to all of those. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about why do we need a thing called recipes? What is a recipe? How can you apply them? What are some of the things that are being worked on? And then again, we're gonna do a bit of a deeper dive specifically around uh, managing events. And then we're gonna finish things off with a live demonstration, starting with sort of a stock Drupal 11 site and then applying some recipes to sort of give you a sense of what are some of the capabilities that you can quickly add. So for starters, why do we need such a thing as recipes? Well, for a long time, we've had things called distributions and install profiles, but they've had some issues. Um, they can be difficult to keep updated, so if you're the sort of distribution maintainer, if you are the owner of a site based on a distribution, you can also have your own share of headaches around you know, being blocked from applying you know, security updates and some of those kinds of things. There are also challenges because you sort of have to know about the distribution before you start your project. So once you've created your project, maybe with one distribution, maybe on like a standard profile, you can't sort of go back and apply a recipe. And you also can't mix and match. So you couldn't say, oh, well, I started my site using the Red Hen Razor distribution, and now I want to add in the, you know, Commerce Kickstart. They're sort of, you know, mutually exclusive, and you sort of have to pick a track again at the very start. And so if you don't know about them before you begin, you know, that means you're, you're sort of stuck. So the idea of recipes is to sort of make them a more composable and lightweight way to add different kinds of configuration to your website. They can install modules but not have any code of their own. And they're meant to be composable. So the idea that, that you can have recipes that call other recipes, and, and then you can see already people creating sort of site recipes that are sort of a very robust way to provide a lot of configuration as a starting point for your Drupal website. Um, from a nomenclature standpoint, people in the recipe community are very sticky about saying you apply a recipe as opposed to install it the way you would a module because notionally the only thing that's, that should be left behind is the configuration that it adds. Um, recipes are meant to be easy to share and um, not lock you into a specific path. So after you apply a recipe to your site, uh, that becomes a starting point. You can completely make it your own. You can rip it out afterwards if you decide it's not a value. Again, meant to be very, very simple. So what goes into a recipe? Probably the most important element is this recipe.yaml file because it will specify what other recipes should be applied. Uh, are there any sort of contrib you know, modules or themes that should be installed? Is there configuration from any of those projects that should be imported? And then are there certain config actions that you should take to sort of, again, modify the configuration of the site that is having this particular recipe applied? Next most important is the composer.json file, which is going to sort of at a composer level define what are all of the different dependencies. And then you can optionally have folders for configuration and content as sort of uh, sets of static configuration files or content files that will get imported as well. So here's an example of a recipe. This is actually one um, we might see later today at the lightning talk. Um, but you can see, you know, we've got a recipe.yaml. This one actually has a readme file as well, a composer.json, and then it has a variety of different sort of static configuration files. And then it actually provides the uh, content files for three taxonomy terms that will be automatically created by this recipe. And notice that the content is always grouped within a subfolder that gives the uh, entity ID of the kind of entity that, that should be created. So for the composer.json file, this is going to look a lot like what you're used to with sort of, you know, Drupal modules and other kinds of projects. You know, name descriptions, keywords, type. Uh, type critically now needs to be Drupal recipe. And then you can specify if you have different kinds of dependencies as well as the ability to sort of suggest other 
recipes or projects that, that might further extend the capabilities. Right now, Suggest doesn't really do a lot. If you command or apply a recipe on the command line, it will sort of spit that out at the end to say, hey, you might also consider these, but you know, I'm hopeful that in time we'll see a better solution for, for how to leverage those and particularly bubble those up through sort of the Drupal UI. The recipe.yaml file is also very similar to what you might be used to with like a project um, info.yaml file today, like for a module or a theme. So name, description, type. Uh, but now you have this key for recipes where you can specify other recipes that you want applied as part of getting your recipe applied. Next you can specify are there different projects that you want installed. So again, modules or themes. And then you can say for those modules or themes, is there any of their configuration that we want to make sure gets imported as part of the, the process of applying your recipe. So you have the ability to sort of throw in a wildcard and just say ingest everything, or you can specifically call out uh, particular ones that you want to have imported, again, as part of your recipe being applied. And then the last, and to me, the, the most exciting part about recipes is this idea of configuration actions. So very flexible ways to sort of manipulate your uh, site configuration in ways that allow for a much more you know, nuanced way of adding configuration to your site. And in particular, I think it's going to make recipes much more flexible in terms of bringing configuration into existing sites as well. So uh, let's talk about what makes up a config action. So first off, you have the key for the actual uh, configuration entity ID that you want manipulated. Then you say, what action do we want to take? So in this case, it's simple config update. So to say, whatever is in this particular key, go ahead and apply this particular value. And then, you know, again, whatever values you want to actually provide to that action. There is also an API for config, config actions. So there are uh, quite a number of config actions already, and we'll, we'll get into those in a moment. But if you need something very specific to your particular needs, you can also create a custom module that will define your own config actions to sort of meet more specialized use cases. So you can see here it's using PHP attributes as a way to specify an ID for, so you know, how are we gonna call this particular config action? You can specify one or more entity types, so they can either be config actions that can be applied to any kind of configuration entity or they can be specific to individual ones and we'll see some examples of those in a moment. And then uh, obviously you need to provide the actual code that defines the logic of how it's going to manipulate that configuration. So we talked about the, the globally available ones, so the ones that don't aren't restricted to particular entities. So here are some, some popular ones. There's a simple config update is one that uh, in using and or sorry, creating recipes, I've used quite a bit. Uh, as well, create if not exists is really um, powerful because you can say, um, here is something. It might be let's say a particular uh, bundle type, or it could be you know the uh, view mode for a particular uh, content type. And you can say, if there isn't one already in the system, here's what I want you to create. But if there is one, do nothing, leave it alone, and move on. In a, same, a similar way, you can sort of add components uh, like fields to configuration entities. You can create new things from scratch, set third-party settings, and then uh, this is actually a link. I've got QR codes all through here. There's documentation. I'll also make the, the entire slide deck available at the end, so hopefully this can also be a bit of a resource for people who want to, to get up and running. Uh, but there are a couple of, of additional ones, and I think you can expect that the list of config actions will grow over time. And there's actually a much broader set of uh, config actions that are specific to different kinds of entities. So for example, with roles, there's a grant permissions config action. For workflows, you can add node types or add taxonomy vac vocabularies. For fields, you can say add this field to all available bundles. Um, or for like CK editor uh, configurations, you can say add this particular item to the toolbar. And again, uh, I think there's like at least 17 other ones that uh, if you go to this uh, documentation page, you can see all of those. There are also ways to use wildcards when you apply config actions. So in this example here, you can say, uh, use the grant permissions and use this wildcard to say, add this to all of the available roles. Or in this case, a component say, you know, add this particular uh, field to all of the available content types and so on. So again, lots of ways that by design, this is meant to be a very sort of flexible and powerful system. 
So some best practices for creating recipes. There's this idea of item potency, which I think before the start of this year, I had never heard that word. Uh, but basically it means it, the idea of being able to apply something again and again um, without there being any kind of an issue or an error. Um, I find it most useful to make recipes that are very granular and again make that kind of a meta recipe that can, can apply them all together if you need to. And finally, you know, get them published, make them available to the community and then hopefully we can all start to, to share these and, and develop some best practices around um, what are the, the best ways to meet some common problems. We did also mention earlier that there is the ability to include content in recipes. Essentially the recipe system includes the import capabilities that were previously in the contrib default content module. So by, by having those content YAML files in your recipe, those will get automatically imported into your site when you apply that recipe. And essentially what you need to do is effectively use the default content model. I find personally at least that's the, the easiest way to export those from the existing site. That will spit out those YAML files for you, again, sort of grouped into the subdirectories based on the entity type ID, and then you can just put all of that directly into your recipe, and you have that ready to go, and it will get automatically imported uh, when you apply that recipe to you know, one or more of your sites. So here's an example of uh, a, a recipe.yaml file. This one, uh, locations recipe, and we'll actually see this one applied in a moment, but you can see there's a variety of different sort of core and contrib modules that are going to get installed. It's going to import a variety of configuration for those modules in addition to using config actions to, you know, use create if not exist, add some different components and so on. So um, lots of sort of, you know, sophisticated conditional logic uh, makes it very flexible in terms of being able to be applied to existing sites or even reapplied to the same site over time. So let's actually do a little bit of a deeper dive into what is the process for applying recipes to your website. Now there is a work already done in the project browser to be able to apply recipes, but um, I think that's still in sort of an alpha state. Usually what I tend to do is use the command line and if you're using Drush 13 on your site, you'll have this Drush recipe command and then you just give it the path to the recipe that you want applied. Uh, worth noting that in Drupal 10 by default, if you use Composer to require a recipe, it'll put it in your doc root, but in Drupal 11, it puts it outside. So the syntax may be a little different based on whether your site is Drupal 10 or 11. Uh, also useful to understand the order in which the recipe runner will sort of go through these different elements. It starts by applying any other recipes that you've specified in your recipe.yaml, then it will install the modules and themes then it will import specified configuration for those modules and themes. Finally, it will import the configuration files that you have in that config directory. Uh, then it will apply the uh, config actions, and then as the last step, it will import any of the content that you have, again, in that content directory. Uh, there's also been quite a bit of work in terms of converting what had been installed profiles in Drupal Core into sort of meta recipes of their own. And so that can be actually a really useful reference if you're wanting to get a sense both you know a look at a lot of different recipes that have been created so if you look at the um, you know standard recipe in Drupal core there's lots of sort of individual smaller recipes that make that up and if you wanted to start your site based on one of those recipes uh, here's what it would look like again start, instead of your sort of standard Drupal install um, in in terms of that standard recipe, here are you know, some of the individual recipes that make that up. And so if you were wanting to create your own recipe as sort of a, a site starting uh, site recipe st starting point, you could you know, pick and choose which of these you want to include in your own recipe as the starting point for something more custom to your particular needs. There's also been some work in terms of converting the umami profile to a set of recipes probably less uh, reusable because it's a lot more opinionated of, in terms of like how the final outcome should look and so on. Uh, but again, kind of a good reference and, and these, um, these exercises of converting those uh, install profiles into recipes has also provided a lot of really useful input in terms of the kinds of config actions that are needed to sort of replace and you know, eventually probably get rid of uh, some of the existing distributions and install profiles. 
So if you're creating your own recipes, definitely try as much as possible to sort of build on what's already available in core because definitely, you know, being able to leverage a lot of the work that's going on in the community is going to make your solution more robust and less work to maintain over time. So what are some, some of the things that the community is working on uh, with respect to recipes? Probably one of the bigger ones is what's called unpacking recipes. So right now, if you were to apply a recipe to your site, you know, when you do that initial composer uh, require, it's gonna pull down all of those dependencies you apply the recipe and imports configuration that's going to leverage and require all of those different dependencies. But then, if you were to actually compose or remove that recipe, you would actually lose all of the all of its dependencies, which is going to leave your site in kind of a broken site because it has configuration that depends on files that are no longer in your code base. So the idea of unpacking recipes is to say, before you sort of compose or remove that recipe take all of its dependencies and actually put those into your site composer.json so that now you have that configuration imported as well as having all of those dependencies explicitly required by your composer.json. Uh, there's also been a lot of work around config validation. Uh, so in the early days, if you imported a recipe and there was something wrong with the configuration, it could leave your site in kind of a broken state. So now it goes through a step of config validation first to make sure that everything is going to be copacetic. And then only if the validation passes will it actually go ahead and apply that to your site um, so that you have some confidence that you know, any uh, sort of config issues will get a resolved, or at least caught, I should say, before the recipe is actually applied. There's, there's still some ongoing work in terms of things like potentially making the validation slightly more flexible, but um, pretty close, I would say. So we already talked about some of the uh, flexibility already built into config actions in terms of being able to use things like the wildcards. Um, but now there's th this idea of potentially being able to have kind of different placeholders for things like specifying permissions again so you don't have to do as much kind of manual work in terms of, of creating out all of these different things. You know, example here being permissions. In terms of a fa phase two roadmap for recipes, so phase one was sort of completed earlier this year. There's now a phase two for the recipes initiative. Uh, some of the things being worked on um, really having a, a better UI for applying recipes. So again, a lot of that work being done in the project browser. There's already some recipes being hosted on Drupal.org. And then uh, the ability to, to do more automated testing with recipes is something that's being worked on. We've already talked about unpacking as sort of a key initiative. And then uh, making sure that the recipe runner will always apply recipes sequentially as opposed to potentially trying to do them in parallel. And then uh, this was actually recently merged in, the ability for a recipe to ask for user input uh, before uh, being applied. So for example, if your recipe uh, needs some kind of an API key to be properly set up, you can make sure that the user is prompted for that. And then that way, at the end of the recipe being applied, it's going to be in a, a fully usable state as opposed to sort of like semi set up that they have to sort of know where to go to put in some crucial bit of information. There are also a couple of new config actions specifically for placing blocks. These have actually been merged into core, but probably won't be released until Drupal 11.1. Um, so previously, you could always place blocks uh, through standard like configuration management, but they were very explicit. So you would have to say exactly which theme you were going to use. You would have to, to know exactly what region you could place that in, and then do things like say, give it a weight, but have to provide sort of an exact numerical weight. And so for a lot of sites where they're using a custom theme, maybe you don't always know exactly what its regions are going to be available. You don't know what blocks they have placed. Um, it's not really going to give you the effect that you want if it works at all. So by using these new config actions, you can say whatever the default theme is on the front end, uh, place a block. You can provide an array of different regions to say, you know, try one of these. And then if you can't find any of those, use a default region, maybe pick something really common like content, and now you have these new uh, position keywords that you can say, place it uh, first in that region or last in that region, and the config action will actually do the work of sort of determining what's the numerical weight that it actually has to use to be able to achieve having that as the first or the last, you know, among all of the blocks already in that region. There is also a lot of work being um, done around documentation. So to date, most of the work has been done in terms of, you know, uh, like markdown files that are actually within the, um, 
the recipes initiative repo, but there's work being planned essentially to, to get that moved into sort of the standard Drupal.org documentation. So for anybody who is really interested in recipes and wants to help out, uh, working on the documentation can be a great place to start. And then there is also this recipes cookbook. Uh, so this is again part of the, the overall documentation for recipes, but there's a whole listing of the existing recipes and then you know the different kinds. So site starter recipes, but also ones that provide different kinds of configuration. Um, but it's also a wiki page, so if you feel inspired to go and create your own uh, recipes, you can by all means get those listed on there and a uh, great way to sort of share and participate in the growing community around recipes as well. So there are, as part of sort of the Starshot initiative or you know, work on Drupal CMS, uh, a variety of different tracks and you can see a lot of these are based around recipes or you know, some of them still being uh, proposed but ultimately will probably be implemented as recipes as well. So I um, wanted to also do a bit of a deeper dive around uh, the events, uh, events track and what are some of the, the different sort of recipes that exist today for working with events in Drupal. So the main one uh, right now is events. So there's a contrib version just called events. So drupal.org slash project slash events. Um, but then there's sort of a modified version that's part of Drupal CMS. Essentially what it does is it gives you an event content type using smart date field. It does also provide add to calendar links and a view for upcoming and past events. Um, and there's some work for UX improvements that are underway there that uh, we should be able to see a little bit later on when we get to our demo. There is an events recipe and then a companion events locations to sort of create a reference there. So by applying the events location recipe, it will automatically apply the location so you end up getting both a new locations content type as well as the reference field in your events. Um, the events or sorry, the locations is set up using address and geo field uh, using nominatum, sort of an open source, uh, open street map space solution so you get sort of free geocoding and map display out of the box. Uh, so it's actually a pretty decent standpoint if, uh, if you want something that is very open source and free to get started with. There is also an a events calendar recipe. So it's currently based on the full calendar view module. Uh, it's pretty nice because it gives you sort of drag and drop capabilities to edit. You can double click to add events. And um, it works pretty smoothly, but uh, recently the, the maintainer of that module, Full Calendar View, um, has basically said that some features that the community is passionate about, has even you know, submitted patches for, uh, will only be implemented as part of the paid premium version. And so, uh, there we go. Um, uh, will only be uh, available as part of a paid premium version and so there's work underway to have a separate community supported module called Full Calendar uh, that eventually this recipe will move toward, towards using. And then there's a, an events registration module you can also use to add a registration system. Uh, it's based on the entity registration module so it's fieldable so you can say for you know, one event maybe you want to collect, you know, t-shirt sizes when people register, but for a different one you want to create or capture like food allergies or different kinds of things, all very easy to do using this uh, fieldable flexible system. Um, and again, some, some UX improvements being worked on as part of that. And then uh, something that I'm interested in putting together but uh, has not been implemented yet is having a recurring recipe. So essentially, the way the events recipe is set up today, if, if you know how to implement it, it's probably like, well, it's, I've got them literally list, listed here. So it's four steps to be able to make your events, uh, be able to manage recurring events, uh, which is great if you know, you know what to do, but the whole idea of recipes and Drupal CMS is to make things easier for people who aren't Drupalists. So being able to have a single recipe that can follow these four steps and essentially you know, make the existing events content type able to handle recurring events, I think would be a win for, again, those people who are new to Drupal. So with that, I'm going to jump into our live demo. And 
go to our demo site. So this is a fresh install of Drupal 10. It's got a few little things uh, here and there added, so gin admin theme, uh, different things. But if we go in here, we can see that we only have our sort of article and basic page content types. And so now to get us started with, ref re with recipes, we're going to go ahead and apply the events recipe. So uh, we can see here, it goes through the process. Uh, one of the things that I find with recipes is that usually it's a good idea to clear the cache after you apply. And now if we go back to our site, you can see we've got this events area. Uh, it's got tabs for upcoming and past events, and it has for admins a prominent call out to go ahead and create an event. So let's just call this our uh, test events. We've got our sort of you know Google Calendar style widget. So we can say let's set this for a couple of weeks out. Maybe we want to set it for 4 p.m. Notice that it automatically sets the end based on the start. And one of the UX improvements that's being worked on right now is this idea of you know on focus for the end time, bringing down sort of the durations again to sort of mimic what people are used to in calendar software all day, and it also makes for sort of a much cleaner interface overall for managing those. Let's go ahead and save that. And so we can see that listed uh, right away. Um, does sort of, you know, intelligent date deduplication, some of those other good things, but not gonna go too far down the rabbit hole of talking about sort of smart date capabilities. But let's go ahead and add some of the other recipes that we um, have already talked about. So the events calendar, let's do events locations. And then let's do the events registration. And if we do our cache clear, and now if we switch back to our demo site and refresh the page. We'll notice a few things here. So now we have a locations area. So if we go in here and similarly say we want to add a location, so let's just say IPA Boston, United States, 53 State Street, and then save that. We're going to see it's in real time going out and geocoding again using free service. Uh, anyway. It's a live demo, so you know there's always got to be something that, to keep things spicy for us. Um, but it's probably some kind of a firewall thing. Um, anyway, it'll display it in a map, and then we can go back to our event. Let's go here, and if we go ahead and edit, we can say, where's it going to happen? Have it there. I would say probably a more robust solution would be to use something like inline any form, but it doesn't have stable release, so that's why it's not included by default in the recipe. Uh, other thing I'll point out if we go down here, so now we have a field for the registration type. So again, you can have different sort of kinds of registration uh, individually fieldable. Um, the recipe sets this sign up as the default for new recipes, but for, or sorry, for new events, but for existing ones, you would have to go ahead and enable that. And now we can see within our event display, we have now the information around where it's going to happen. We have the, the sign up form here. And then we also have, I'll point out the add to calendar links. One other thing I'll point out about the add to calendar links is that they use the current color, even though they're SVGs. So if we go ahead and go into our appearance, into our settings, for all the arrow, and let's change our color to firehouse, and save that, go back to our event. The um, add calendar links will always use sort of, you know, the, the prominent sort of site link color as well. So automatically take on the branding of, of your overall site, and then, you know, all of your information gets immediately passed in. Um, if we go back to our events, uh, notice as well that we have this calendar tab now. So we've got our interactive calendar. We can sort of drag and drop to change the date. We can go within the date to do things like, say, drag and drop to change the time or even the duration. And now if we go back to here, we can see that all of that, all of those changes were saved to the database as we were going along.
Last thing I'll point out is if we refresh it and go to the monthly view, if you double click on a particular day, it takes you to the create event interface already pre-selected with the date where you had double clicked. So again, making it very easy and intuitive for you know, newcomers to be able to use this calendar as an interactive tool to manage their different events. So um, let's move on to talking about, um, hopefully by now you're, you're as inspired and excited as I am about uh, working with recipes, uh, right? <laughs> What are what are some of the ways that, that you can sort of help out with uh, you know this this recipes initiative and make it even more sort of robust and capable? So um, definitely you know we already talked about a documentation as a good place to jump in and get started. Uh, certainly you know anybody who uh, feels like um, they have sort of developer chops or even uh, some passion around sort of testing out some of the things that are being built, uh, all of that tremendously useful. As I mentioned, the ability to sort of automated, uh, do automated testing of recipes is still in development, but uh, that's definitely an area that could use lots of help. Uh, certainly making your own recipes and sharing them, I think will continue to sort of drive excitement around the initiative in general. There is a recipes channel in Drupal Slack. Uh, that's a great place to sort of go in, join the conversation, and there are meetings every other Tuesday at 1600 UTC. Uh, where you can go in and sort of, again, be part of the discussion in terms of what are the, the primary topics, things that people are working on today. Uh, there will also be a contrib day at uh, DrupalCon Barcelona uh, for anybody who's going to be there as well. So uh, that should be everything that you need to be able to go ahead and get started using recipes. Um, this is a QR code for this slide deck. So um, again, you can sort of capture that if there's stuff that you want to use as a reference but at this point, happy to turn it over for questions. Yes. So, for an example, in your calendar, uh, sorry, your events implementation, why would someone implement this using the recipe instead of module? So the question was, uh, what, what are the advantages of implementing this as a recipe instead of as a module? So I would say a, a couple of things. So I mean, ironically, to begin with, a lot of the capabilities within that particular recipe uh, were in a module, but the the module implementation really only only allows for sort of a literal import of configuration. Uh, so you don't have any of the benefits of sort of that configuration actions. Um, and then also, if you wanted to sort of create content, like we saw the example of the alerts recipe that creates those uh, taxonomy terms, you would have to sort of write code to do that yourself um, as part of something like an install hook as opposed to having sort of a system that'll do a lot of that work for you. So there's a lot more flexibility, I think, in terms of doing that as a recipe as well. Yes? How much, if any, of it is just the, the social expectations that while a module technically might be able to reach into areas generally thought of as the area of other modules and change them and add fields to existing content types. I think people don't expect installing a module to do that, but recipes, I think, are a convention that just more clearly communicate, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna add fields to existing content types because that's what we say we're gonna do. Is that part of it? So I'm gonna do my best to summarize that uh, <laughs> one question for the, the sake of the recording. Um, is part of the value of recipes maybe changing a bit of the sort of social expectation of, of um, what will happen when you apply something, particularly as a recipe, versus um, applying a module that uh, site builders may not expect to have as far-reaching implications in terms of what it might change on your site. I think there's definitely some truth to that, and uh, particularly because of the fact that recipes by design pull in a lot of different dependencies and have this whole system for configuration of you know, modifying things in very flexible ways. I think there's definitely sort of changing the expectation about, you know, different ways that it, it should do probably a lot more out of the box as a recipe than, than necessarily might be expected as sort of just a module that imports configuration. I think that's true. Uh, let's see a question over there. You were adding fields to the content type of data notification of things. Can you then write in a full display or a full display layout over section two with field number X? So I'm going to be honest and say there were bits of that question that I'm not sure I completely heard, so I'll do my best to, to repeat it back, and if there's something that I, I missed or got wrong, then, then please uh, shout out. Um, 
We showed the, the ability to add a field to an existing content type using a recipe, but could we also do things like uh, change the layout of how it's displayed or you know, some of the other like, deeper capabilities around the ways um, either individual fields or even the content that they reference gets displayed? Uh, if that is indeed the question, then the simple answer is yes. Um, you can definitely do all of those things. Things like applying a layout builder layout, which was part of your question, um, I expect is something that you should be able to do, but I will confess it's not something that I have yet tried myself, so there may be some you know, dark magic required to make that work entirely as expected, but um, because of the ways that things like layout builder layouts for like um, you know, display modes and some of those other things work, I see no reason why it, it shouldn't be something that could be part of the recipe as well. Yes. You mentioned that uh, phase two is to build a kind of like a recipe application UI or some kind of UI for recipes. Is that UI project browser or is it something different? So the question was, when we spoke about the UI for applying recipes earlier, is that project browser or is that something different? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so there's definitely some work already in Project Browser, so it's like the version 2 branch that can now apply recipes. I think there might still be some things around it being able to properly query an API from Drupal.org that sort of understands the available recipes and applies those, so there's again still some work to be done there. But if you use the Starshot uh, CMS installer, there's also UI elements in there already today in terms of it being able to say, hey, you're about to install Drupal, like which of these different capabilities do you want? And ultimately those are recipes that are part of that um, repo. So you, you have, again, like different UIs depending on, on the ways in which the recipe is meant to, to be displayed. Uh, did I see there's another question? I see one in the back. When you're developing a new recipe, are you able to use configuration or content from the existing site to export it in some way or use that as a basis of a recipe? So the question was, when, apply, when creating a recipe, is there the ability to sort of export content from an existing site? And definitely, that's exactly the way that I've tended to use it when creating recipes myself. So setting up a content type, maybe the fields and some of those other things in an existing site, doing sort of your you know, Drush config export, and then from there sort of cherry picking and, and assembling the, the set of configuration that you want to be part of your recipe. Um, there are also a couple of projects that uh, potentially may help to, to make the, the path of creating recipes a little bit easier. I know uh, Kevin Quillen created a recipe generator, but I feel like last time I checked it hadn't been worked on in over a year and there's been a lot of sort of you know movement in the sort of overall recipes initiative. So I'm not sure exactly like how up to date that is in terms of being useful. There is also a, a, an issue open against the features module because features, the modern version of it, what it does is it essentially does a similar thing in terms of being able to say, you tell it what things you want and then it figures out all of the dependencies and wraps that up today in kind of a module that actually doesn't even require features. So I feel like all it would need to do is change the structure of, of how it does that a little bit to more closely match what recipes ex expect and you could actually make that a much more flexible way uh, to potentially create uh, recipes as well. So um, hopefully one or two, or like at least one of those will get some traction or maybe something new will come along, but I suspect that the tooling around creating recipes will continue to get better and better in the coming months as well. Uh, did I see there was another question? Did you have a follow-up? <laughs> Okay. So, the, there's, what do you think about, is there any relative risk involved when applying a recipe? Is there like any kind of situation where, where you get into destructive actions or um, are, there, are there instances where, like, I imagine with some default content there's a possibility that you might want to run a recipe against a production site because you want to be able to scaffold the content into production. There's no other way to really move it through the config actions or uh, the regular you know, config process. Um, are, is that is that risky? Is that is there always potential that you just like you know go back and, and think and board and you're back to your starting point? Or, like, so, so the question was, are there risks associated with applying a recipe to your site? Uh, I would say, generally speaking, the answer is there's there's not a lot of risk, but certainly there's not no risk. So when you think about config actions that potentially can do things like 
you know, um, ag fields that later you might decide that they, you know, want. There's not a lot of risk, right? Like, you know, you can go out and, and strip that out manually. I would say generally you're probably always going to want to make sure you have a, a database backup or a fresh configuration export just before you do that so that you have some kind of a rollback strategy in case you find that what the recipe has done isn't what you want. Um, but there, there are certain config actions that can change things that may not be in ways that you sort of expected or anticipated or, and again, want. And so having a rollback strategy, I would say today, is, is definitely a good practice. Um, I wouldn't typically say you would want to, you know, certainly apply recipes to your production site in general, but then, you know, you, you raise a good point about, like, if it creates different content, then, then what's the best path to, to move those? And I feel like some of those questions is probably going to be evolving best practices as we get, you know, more and more adoption of recipes overall in the community and, and figure out what that, the path is, integrating those with production workflows and some of those other things as well. Another question over here? Very quickly, it sounds like identity would also be another thing that would have to be a best practice to ensure that, right? Because even in Ansible, you can create a task that, as much as they say, is a diffident, not as a diffident as you thought it was when you wrote it. So the question was, it, uh, I call it item potency, but maybe your pronunciation sounds better to me. But anyway, um, whichever way you pronounce it, the, the idea of being able to apply recipes again and again is definitely a best practice. Um, and. Uh, to me, you know, that's that's probably one of the trickiest parts about sort of making your recipe uh, robust enough to, to sort of share with the community is, is testing it out in those different scenarios, as you say, making sure that it can be applied again and again. And that's where the configuration actions really start to hold their most value because now you can say, instead of saying, I want to provide this view mode, you know, in a very literal way, you can say, if there isn't a view mode for this, Here's what it should be, but if there is something that the site builder has already configured, then just leave it alone and not, let's not worry about it. So um, I agree with you, and I also think that's, again, where the config actions start to, to really show their value. Uh, did I see there was another question? How are we doing for time? A little bit of time if there's another question. Otherwise, oh, Tim. Uh, well, I'm talking <laughs> to you later. I have lots of questions. Okay. So we talked about, uh, how about uh, in building, or, uh, uh, we've been, I, I'm involved in that, and we've been also experimenting with these recipes. One of the things I'm running into is sometimes configuring a feature, um, it doesn't look very good, uh, without some style. Like, I want to provide a little bit of style. How is that handled? Uh, so the question was, with recipes, what's the sort of vector to do some kind of you know, formatting so that things look good out of the box? I would say today the path would really be to, to provide a module that would contain you know, different kinds of uh, formatting. And then you could sort of say, for your recipe, to require that, that companion module that includes, you know, let's, let's say, a, a library that has you know, CSS and maybe some JavaScript too. And then you can say, by default, get that module installed so that, as you say, when you apply the recipe, now you have the formatting out of the box. People can turn that off and you know migrate some of that code into their custom theme or whatever they want to do. Um, but to me, at least right now, that seems to be the best way to, to sort of have it look good as soon as you uh, apply your recipe. Yeah. Is that another question? Not. I think we're pretty much at time. So uh, yeah, by all means, you know, hit me up on the hallway track and we can uh, talk more. So thanks all.